Chris and I have known each other for a really long time, and the first time I, I heard him was um, at his latest book signing, and I was so impressed that I got so close to the person who wrote The Long Tale that I came up to him and I said, I really want to talk with you. And then every time I've heard him since then, he's just given amazing, very inspiring talks about what makes great products. So welcome, Chris. Great to have you here. Way to lower the expectations. Um, okay, so let me tab over to um, my presentation. Um, uh, so I, when Sophie and I were talking about this, um, we were uh, talking about uh, getting to. Uh, do I need to push the button? I need to push the button. Holding down. Testing, testing, perfect. Um, we, we, I was talking about getting to V1, and, and I was reflecting on the fact that it's um, when I got to V1 in my current job, and we, I, I run 3D robotics, we, we make drones, when I, I came out of the maker movement, and when I got to V1, we got away with murder. It was so easy, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I realized that we could not have done that again today, that something has changed, and that maybe and we're not in the maker movement anymore, that maybe that moment when you could use the 3D printers and your Arduino and the basement and the soldering iron and get on Kickstarter and, 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 and have a success, maybe that moment has gone and that suddenly it's starting to look more, much more like a traditional process of getting to V1, which would be on one sense very sad because people like me couldn't do it anymore. Another sense completely normal, which is that which is that um, the level of customer expectations for a product has now grown to the point, and, the tw and, and there's enough, and there's a, another way to get to that level of sophistication, that um, you know the products get better, and um, you know maybe it's not the maker movement, maybe the maker movement remains amateur. But so I'm going to tell you two stories in this in this presentation. I'm going to tell you the story of what getting to V1 looked like six years ago. And then a little bit, just coming, having come back from CES, about what getting, getting to V1 looks like now. And you will, I think, be able to detect the difference pretty easily. Um, so this is, um, this is what, um, how I got started. Um, I have five children, and um, my wife and I are trained as scientists, and we're always trying to get our kids excited about science and technology. And uh, this is my daughter, Erin, who's nine, and I, I, was, I was the editor of Wired magazine. And um, on Fridays, these products would come in, and you know, for review, and you could take it home on the weekend if you promised to review it. And so one of the products that came in was the beta of the Lego Mindstorms robotics kit, and another was a radio control airplane. And I thought this was gonna be great. On Saturday, we're gonna build a robot with the kids, and on Sunday, we're gonna fly a plane. And something about this will resonate, and they'll get excited about science and technology. So this is Aaron um, you know, going through the instructions on the TriBot, and this is Daniel, her, 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 her brother, and this is, you know, after spending an entire morning programming it, um, we push the button and, and, it, and, you know, the good news is that it works. The bad news is what working means after spending a morning programming robots is that it very slowly moves forward until it hits a wall and then backs away. <laughs> and, the, and the kids are like, you've got to be kidding, right? We've seen Transformers wear the frickin' lasers, <laughs> right? And there's like, you know, once again, Dad, you're, you know, Hollywood has ruined robotics for children because you can't compete with CG. Um, real robots are hard and they don't have frickin' lasers. Um, and uh, so the kids were like, you know, that sucked. And I was like, okay, stay tuned. Tomorrow we're going to take an airplane to the field and we're going to fly it to the park and we're going to fly it. So we go on YouTube video. We all watch YouTube videos of acrobatics and it's all very impressive. And this is the plane and, and this is the way it ended. <laughs> and, um, and it was just humiliating for me. It was mortifying for them. I had to bribe them with ice cream, you know. And they're like, you know, once again, Dad, our little science and technology projects with you suck. Um, we're not doing this anymore. And, and I was really disappointed because, you know, um, I, I started a whole site called Geek Dad about, about, you know, science and technology projects that were exciting for kids and fun for parents and, you know, an opportunity to, you know, really, you know, find common ground. And, you know, here's my little Geek Dad project, total abject failure. And I, was, and I went for a run. I was kind of let off steam, a little angry. And I went for a run. I thought, how could that have gone better? And I thought, well, what we needed was a cooler robot and a better flying plane. And I thought, well, what if the robot had flown the plane? It certainly was cooler than the robot that we got, and you know, it couldn't be worse than me. And so this was, this was the autopilot that we created that night on the dining room table. I gathered the kids around, one last go. 
Um, and I posted this on a site that, uh, called Slashdot that was big, big back then. And, and I said, world's first Lego autopilot, which in fact it was. And, um, and it got a lot of attention. It didn't actually work, but <laughs> we put it in a plane um, and, uh, you know, woke, woke Daniel up early to, to hold it one morning. So I was pretty proud of it. The next weekend, we, we, we put it in the air. And uh, it actually did kind of almost fly. Not terribly well, um, but I did a version two. And this one had gyros and accelerometers and magnetometers and, you know, GPS connection to a Bluetooth GPS module and put that in a better plane. And this one actually did work. And I got chills. This was sort of my, my you know, the, the birth of my, my current incarnation. This is my entry as a maker. This is my entry as, a, as an entrepreneur. This was, you know... This was, this was I, don't, I, don't, I don't get chills very often, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe the internet, you know, did it. Um, and this is a moment where I was like, wait, my kids and I, around the dining room table, Googled flying robot, the first result was autopilot, the first result was drone, we then Googled drone, the first result was autopilot, we Googled autopilot, and the first result was like math, so we stopped Googling. Um, and... With toy parts, we built what's essentially regulated by the U.S. government as a cruise missile controller on the dining room table, programmed by a nine-year-old, and it worked. Something in this world has changed. I didn't know what. You know, whenever you get, whenever something, you, whenever you do something that shouldn't be possible, and it is possible, you're like, what just happened there? Something big. And, you know, I mean, I, I was the editor of Wired for 12 years. I was, lots of technology was coming from my desk, but I didn't get chills very often. I, I knew there was something up. So because I didn't know the answer, I created a, uh, a community called DIY Drones. It was largely designed to ask dumb questions in public. And you know, two wonderful things happen when you ask dumb questions. The first is that people answer your dumb questions. And the second is that it liberates people to ask their own dumb questions. And this just happened to be a moment. 2007, in retrospect, was the moment. When you, everyone asked, when did hardware get cool? When did hardware get hot? When did hardware become like software? When did this hardware renaissance start? It was 2007. Anyone who was paying attention spotted something in the air in 2007. So like the Fitbit team, for them it was the Wii controller. They got a Wii controller and it's like they could move this thing and it like moved it. It's like, whoa, what's in here? What else could it do? For other people, 2007 was really important. Um, uh, the um, 3D printing, the, the RepRap project, that got popular. Arduino, the open source computing project, got popular. The first Maker Fair started just a year before, but that one was the first one that was really popular. Make Magazine. There were a bunch of other things. For us, it was Lego Mindstorms had those same sensors. The accelerometers and the gyros were in there. Um, and um, you know, the question was, what, what, what is this thing? And I think after, after what this community quickly realized is that we were all gravitating towards smartphone guts. That was the thing that basically a, an adjacent industry, the smartphone industry, had just started, to, started taking off. And, the, and it, was, it was the economies of scale, the stuff that went in smartphones, the sensors and the cameras and the GPS and the wireless and the ARM core processors, they were getting faster at a pace that was much faster than any other industry we've seen before. Basically, Moore's Law is still moving faster in your pocket than, it is than, any, than we've ever seen in any industry before. And that stuff was starting to spill out into adjacent industries. And, you know, for us, you know, these were the ones that, were, that, 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 that you know, we, these are the ones that affected us. And the thing is that nobody knew they were in an adjacent industry. I didn't know I was in the drone industry until I was able to buy chips from Radio Shack that could control a drone. And likewise for robotics and, and everything else. And so these industries, wearables, robotics, Internet of Things, desktop manufacturing, all this big data, these all turn out to be adjacent to smartphones and are basically drafting off the pace of innovation in the smartphone industry and the economies of scale, the Samsungs and Apples and LGs of the world, that you can now get like supercomputers for like no money, with these amazing sensors and they're all connected. And now stuff that used to be like unobtainium, you know, a, 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 a gyro, a gyroscopic sensor used to be this big, cost $10,000 and was mechanical and you couldn't buy one because they were export controlled. And now a single chip from Vincense has nine sensors like that three gyros, three accelerometers, three magnetometers, a processor, it's, you know, it is the size of your fingernail and it costs $7. And so that's like, that, that's from like $100,000 for nine degrees of freedom to $7 in about 10 years. And to say nothing of the size, going from like a box the size of a refrigerator to, to something the size of your fingernail. And, and likewise for every one of these other technologies. And so when you look at why are these so, why is this happening? Why, is it, why are we seeing this explosion where consumer electronics is, 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 is exciting? And 
you know, hardware, it, there's hardware entrepreneurship, and you have Kickstarters. And, why is, and the answer is we're all drafting off smartphones. And that's what, we, that's what I realized once we set up this community. So then that was great, but it was just a hobby. It was just a community. And we were designing, we're trading design files and code. It was very exciting, soldering irons and sending PCBs off to be fabbed and building tool chains. And um, I was thrilled. I mean, I was back, I was getting my hands dirty as a maker. Then the next generation of people come to the community and they're like, that's awesome, um, but I would rather not solder. I'd rather not, you know, I'd rather not, you know, build a tool chain. Can you just, you know, make it for me? And I was like, oh, I guess we'll have to start a company. So here is our first factory. Um, this, is, uh, these, uh, this is the same dining room table. These are um, some of my kids. They are our first product. Um, as you can see, we pay them with, uh, with strawberries and juice. This was an autonomous blimp. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, this, um, the, uh, some of those parts were actually um, uh, manufactured for me in China. And I'd actually gone to Alibaba, and I like, wanted to buy motors. The first lesson you learn when you're selling kits is you can't buy your parts at retail if you intend to sell a kit at, at, you know, at, at a reasonable price. So we, I went to China to buy motors. And um, I, went to this, I went to Alibaba. This is early on. I went to Alibaba, and I was like, you know, search for motors, and up comes these, all these companies that sell motors. And I was like, okay. They have this little instant messenger client where you can convert and re converse in real time between Chinese and English. And I was like, I would like to buy some motors. And they're like, what kind of motors would you like? And I was like, what kind do you have? And they're like, what kind would you like? And I was like, wait, <laughs> what do you have? And said, that's not the way it works. You, you design a motor, and we make it for you. And it's like, what do I know about motors? And they're like, no worries. Here's this, like, this form. You fill out these drop-down menus, windings and magnets and shaft size and dimensions. And I just sort of took a motor I had, and I kind of measured it. And I said, yeah, I'd like one of those. And they're like, great. Um, how many would you like? And I was like, I don't know, 300. And they're like, well, at 300, there'll be you know, $2 each. But at 3,000, there'll be 70, dollars, 70 cents each. And at 30,000, there'll be like 20 cents each. And I was like, OK, I'll take 3,000. And uh, they said, great, how would you like to pay? And you know, I'd lived in China. My kids were born there. So you know, I'd live in China. I knew what it was like to get factories in China to work for you. You fly to Hong Kong. You, know, you, you get an introduction. You cross the border, translate. Are very awkward meetings. You know, real communication errors. If it goes well, then, you know, then they give you a tour. They're still not quite sure why you're there. Then, you, then you, uh, if it's going really well, you go and yeah, you have, you have uh, you know, drinks afterwards and the, the humiliating karaoke ritual. If it's going really, really well, then you have dinner together, and as a guest of honor, you have to eat the eyeballs. And then, you know, on the basis of that, you know, they will ex agree to do business with you. At what, that point, you need a letter of credit. Then the faxes move back and forth, massive communication errors, you know, wrong, 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 wrong. You get back on a plane. Eventually, you know, six, nine months later, it gets working. And, and it, I just basically clicked, and, you know, that evening, and they said, how would you like to pay? And I was like, OK, here it comes, letter of credit. And they're like, you know, Visa or PayPal? And I said, PayPal. And they said, great. And uh, press the button. And then 10 days later, this, this like, this, like a crate appears on my doorstep. And there are 3,000 motors manufactured to my custom specification, um, beautifully packed, you know, a little you know, film of oil over them. And I realized I'd just gotten robots in China to work for me, and they took PayPal. And that was the second time I got chills. And then I knew that you know, the, the route, the, the road to V1 had changed. When, it, when, when you know, the web changed, when regular people on their laptops or their you know, canonical bedrooms could type some code, push a button, and start a company or create a product, where the web had sort of lowered the barriers to entry to prototyping, production, and manufacturing and distribution to the point that anybody could do it on a laptop, that's when the web took off. Now hardware looked like that as well. So that was great. Um, but then I, you know, so, so uh, we, were, we basically were, it's a factory. We were making something. And what we were making was this. We, it was a robot blimp, pizza boxes. And then we learned like an important lesson, um, which is that the worst thing that can happen to you when you have this little sort of cottage industry is that people want what you make. Because then they buy that thing, and then you have to make more of that thing. And you thought it was a one-time thing, but actually when you have to make more of this, you have to actually get the kids back to the dining room table. And, and there are not enough strawberries in the world to get them to do it a second time. And it was like, OK, that sucked. <laughs> we're out of stock. 10 minutes in, we're out of stock. I can't get the kids to make this again. I guess I'm going to have to need, I'm gonna need help. So there was this guy on the internet on our, on our site. He was the smartest guy. He was flying a helicopter with Wii controller. His name was Jordi Munoz. And I met him on the internet, and I said, he seemed, seemed like brilliant. And I was like, 
you want to help? We can start like a company together. He said, sure. And he said, okay, well, I basically need someone to solder the board. So here he is um, uh, soldering the boards. And that's the end of it. I'm like, done. Great. He's got it. My kids, I don't get my kids around the dining room table anymore. They're going to um, make the product. And um, I kind of forgot about it until he kept sending me pictures. And he said, we moved to a new space. And I'm like, oh. I, you know, the first thing I said was, they've got shelves. That is totally pro. And then he said, and then he said we've got a bookkeeper. And I was like, a bookkeeper? That's awesome. And then, you know, he said who these other people are. And then, and then, he sent, then the next year he sends me another picture. And he's like, he's like um, yeah, so we got these pick and place machines from eBay, these used ones. And we downloaded the manual from Google. And, um, and then we got these stencil printers and reflow ovens and CMC machines. And um, I was like, S -s what? Who is this guy? And then, and then he sends me another picture. We've opened up a second factory. This is a clean room in Tijuana. And I was like, they've got, they've got smocks with our name on it. Um, and actually, if you look closely, they, uh, they have these, uh, these straps, these electrostatic discharge uh, straps um, around their wrists, which are connected to the machine. And somebody looked at that and they said, this is always the way we do post things on the internet. They said, you chain your workers to the machines? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, and at this point, I had to meet the guy, you know, and, um, and this is a guy I'd met. And it turned out that I'd started a company with a, with a, a, a teenager in Tijuana. He was a 19-year-old when we first, we first encountered him, and he still hadn't been to college yet. And I was like, okay. So, you know, in the 20th century, the editor of Wired does not normally start a 21st century aerospace company with a, 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 a Tijuana teenager he met on the internet. Um, however... <laughs> Things have changed, and it turns out that what Tijuana teenagers know is three amazing things. Number one, um, they're, they're teenagers, so they, they, they're just the, the web generation. They just, they just get born in the world of the greatest information resources ever, ever, ever seen, completely fearless, total access to, to all great information. Number two, it's Tijuana. Manufacturers just in the air. This is what people do in Tijuana is they start factories. Um, and number three, uh, they're completely fearless. Um, you know, the idea that you would... You know, that, you know, so if, you were, if I asked you, you know, to start a, you know, kind of a world-class electronic manufacturing you know, operation with pick-and-place machines, you, the first place you probably would not go is like eBay <laughs> and just buy them and download the manual and just do it. And you might like ask for advice or learn or hire a consultant or something, but these guys just did it. All cash flow, no funding whatsoever. But anyway, on the basis of this, we, I, I, then he showed me the balance book for the year. He said, we're going to do $5 million in revenue this year. And I was like, what? So I quit my job, and we raised money, and, um, and then we built more factories. Um, uh, sorry, we built more factories. This is, um, this is, uh, this is you know, one of many uh, lines in our, in our Tijuana factory right now. This is our, one of our San Diego operations plants. This is our Austin Man uh, sales and marketing center. This is our Berkeley um, uh, engineering center. We now have factories in Shenzhen, Shanghai, and... Um, you know, we're America's leading drone manufacturer two years after you know, we essentially started, started the, the company proper. Now, that was absolutely great. I mean, you know, maker, maker gone good. Um, but that could not have worked today. Um, these are the kind of things we, we, we make. We eventually got to where we needed to be. But we started with pizza boxes and Lego parts and bags in bo boards and bags and no instructions and no packaging. And we started really shambolically amateur. And we had time to figure it out. And eventually, we, we got to the point where we were venture-backed. And now we manufacture with PCH um, you know, in, in, in China. And we have industrial designers and all this kind of stuff. But we had time to learn on the job. And, now we can make this kind of stuff. But this is, that was then. And I think this is the second story. Um, and this is why that doesn't work anymore. These bastards who I love, um, Pebble, uh, ruined it for everybody. I love my Pebble. I love Pebble. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but this Kickstarter project, which was like the first $10 million hardware Kickstarter project, um, raised the bar to a, to a level which is fantastic for consumers, fantastic for Pebble. Um, but it's actually really, really hard to do. They didn't start with a circuit board. They didn't start with, ba with, a, with, a, with a bag or compilers or soldering, et cetera. They started with a really polished consumer electronics product. And, um, uh, and um, you know, more credit, more power to them. They kicked Sony's butt, which I'm, I, 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 the way I tell the story, and I know Eric, the, uh, the CEO, pretty well, and he, he, I don't think it's exactly right, but he, he, he lets me tell it this way, that, that Sony announced their smartwatch on the same day that Pebble announced the Pebble on Kickstarter. 
and um, Pebble won. I mean, nobody bought Sony's smartwatch, and the Pebble, you know, is I think not only a great product, but it's probably going to compete with Apple pretty successfully. And um, it was just a tribute to doing things right, grassroots, organically, building community, getting feedback, nimble. They, they just, the, sort of the Silicon Valley model, if you will, um, applied to consumer electronics. And they did it, they did it, you know, with a little bit of maker spirit, but, um, but also they very quickly understood that they needed to go to China, use contract manufacturing, and, and do it right. And that, that is now the floor. I mean, I think if you're going to release a consumer electronics product, if you're going to be a hardware entrepreneur today, you kind of have to be as good as Pebble. Um, and, and so this is the skills, forgive, the, forgive all the text, these are the skills you now need. Industrial design. Mobile, UI, UX, you know, software stuff, packaging, boxes, cardboard. Who, you know, who knew, right, how complex that is? And one of our, um, we, we were, uh, Um, we accompanied uh, quite a company called uh, here in the in in the city, and they were talking about one of their original products, and they um, they designed the, the product and did a great job. And then as an afterthought, they designed the box, and they went to the factory, and it turned out the box took twice as long to assemble as the product because they hadn't done it right. And so you need to get good at this customer service, supply chain management. Don't even get me started on procurement and 30 net and 60 net and 90 net and and you know letters of credit and. Then, I mean, just that, that string of, you know, jokey ac acronyms, ERP, MRP, CRM, CMS. I mean, if you don't know what those mean, you, you know, and your hardware, you will soon. Then the skills you need. When I look at just the people we hire, the Emmys and double E's and CS and the MFAs and MBAs and CPAs and JDs, you know, et cetera. And basically, I need to be able to kind of be conversational with every one of those skill sets to, to be able to run something as complex as interdisciplinary. And then there's the stuff that the, the, the utter surprise is that you can only learn through incredible pain, like how is it possible that Chinese New Year lasts six weeks? <laughs> and, and if you don't know what I'm, what I'm talking about, you, you, you soon will. Um, so this is like what it takes to get to V1 today in, in, in hardware. And it looks a lot like what it took to get to V1 long, you know, a decade ago. You know, we've kind of reverted to traditional manufacturing skills. The difference being is that it's a lot cheaper uh, to do it, but many of those things are available via virtual kind of cloud manufacturing uh, contract, you know, things like Alibaba and contract manufacturing services are available. Um, the, the prototyping tools, that the, the R&D process to get to the point that you do this is a lot easier, but, you know, we regress to the mean. Um, you know, once you get serious, it, things, you start, have to, you realize that there's skills out there that, you know, good old fashioned manufacturing skills that you gotta learn, and um, there's no shortcut. It's not like the web, where you really don't have to learn, you know, if you're in the media industry and you're on the web, you don't have to learn how a printing plant works. If you're in the hardware industry, you gotta learn how a factory works. So let, this takes me to, to, the, to the end, which is, which is um, CES 2015. And let me actually jump forward a slide. Um, our biggest competitor is a Chinese company called DJI. And, um, and uh, th this is their booth at CES in Las Vegas this year. Um, but it wasn't just their booth. All of the other competitors were Chinese companies, mo many of whom we'd never heard of. And that, if there was a one word theme of, of CES this year, I would say it is China. Um, uh, they are innovating, they are, they're entrepreneurial, um, they're polished, they're going global on day one. And what it reminded me is that, is that people always said, don't worry, China can't do X. You know, don't worry, you know, we Silicon Valley or we, you know, US companies or whatever, you know, we have s special skills. Um, it's hard to do what we do and China can't do software or design or you know, industrial design or graphic design or UI UX, they're bad at interfaces. They're, they can't do marketing. Oh, don't worry, they won't be, they don't have global brands. Uh, they're terrible management, you know, um, customer support. Wrong, 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 wrong. There is no X. And that's the lesson from CES. There's nothing <laughs> China can't do. Now someday we'll find out if there is an X. But right now, I would say assume there is no X. We are privileged to compete with one of the first 21st century Chinese companies. This is a company that's called the Apple, the Pearl River Delta. But basically in Shenzhen, um, you know, these, these companies are making iPhones for the last 10 years and they were taking notes. And now all those skills, because everything is, in, is, is adjacent to the smartphone industry, because all those skills of hardware and software and components and electronics and RF design and packaging, all those skills that Apple pioneered 
with consumer electronics, and everybody who followed Apple did, and made in Shenzhen, those skills are now in the air, they're in the water, they're, they are, that's, now, that's now available, turnkey, you know, on tap in Shenzhen. And that stuff that I told you about that was really hard for me, all that supply chain stuff and the EM, you know, CMSs and, and ERPs and MRP, that's in the air. That's just, that's just like, like my advantage was I, I partnered with a kid from Tijuana who knew manufacturing. But had I partnered with the kids in Shenzhen, they would have known not just manufacturing, but they would have known everything else. You know, the industrial design, not just the electronics, but the plastics and the cabling and the CNC metals and everything else. Um, so, um, you know, the, the good news is that they're available to you. Um, they'll work, they work brilliantly with, uh, with companies anywhere. Um, the bad news is that there's a lot of them, and they're going to be competing with you as well. So I kind of end up, uh, this is sort of my last slide, um, I, I ended up with this sort of sense that, you know, the road to version one is a combination of doing what we do well, the kind of, you know, that, that, the core of that maker spirit, the prototyping, the innovation, the, the, you know, the, the garage, and then very quickly understanding that you're in a global manufacturing industry and you have to get there very quickly. So the prototypes, you know, the stuff you see around you, that's, that's the one to 100. Then you very quickly need to, you know, turn it into something relatively sophisticated. You know, it's not enough to ship a board. And there you do the, the Alibabas of the world, the, the sort of outsourced manufacturing. It's not scalable, and not only that, but it's also often slow and, and, and risky. If you order the wrong board, you get the wrong board. And so then you need to kind of, you know, in the, when you're in the innovation, the, the steep part of the innovation cycle, and you're changing the product on a daily basis, and, you're, and, you're, and, you, and you don't want to, you know, batch produce 100,000 and have them all sent back because they don't work, then you might want to bring the manufacturing back and, and you, know, work, you, know, you know, work close to your market. Um, so you can do small batch, high, high innovation, you know, um, high, high touch manufacturing. And that'll take you maybe to the 10,000 range. But when you get into the 100,000s and beyond, back to China, you go. And there, and there you're working with the Foxconns of, of the world or the PCHs of the world. And, this, and, that, and being able to live on both sides of that curve, being able to appreciate what the maker movement gives you on flexibility and innovation and prototyping, but also understand that if you're going to be a build a business, you got to get good at traditional manufacturing. You got to you got to know what they know on the streets of Shenzhen. Those are the dual skill sets that are required to get to version one today. I was lucky enough to have, you know, six years to learn that. Today, you know, you got 12 months at at, at best. Um, the good news is it's never been easier to learn these skills. The bad news is you got to learn them and you got to learn them fast. And with that, thank you very much. We'll do, uh, we'll do some Q&A for Chris. And Chris, if you could repeat the question as you get it, that'd be great. Absolutely. So yeah, it, um, we, have time, we have time for a little Q&A. So if anybody had any questions on, this, on these two journeys or uh, how, to, uh, how to do them well today, I'll try to repeat the question. Yes. With your uh, Tijuana teenager, you made it sound like you just kept like amping up with these factories and stuff while you were just sort of hanging out. Yeah. Like, maybe you could just talk a little more about. The question was, you know, uh, say more about how a Tijuana teenager sort of ramped up a factory while I while I was hanging out. Um, uh, well, Jordy is first of all a phenomenon. He's um, he, he's brilliant. Um, what he did is he worked on cash flow, um, and so he would, um, you know, he started he started simple. So he, li you know, literally bought a used pick and place machine on eBay. Uh, his first reflow oven was a, a toaster oven from Target with a PID controller that he hacked with an Arduino, and then um, and then he then then it was then it was it was it was, it was it was full. You know, we needed more, so then he bought a better one. And he just, he started easy, and he just, and he just cut incrementing up to a better, better pick and place <laughs> machines, learning on stencil printers. You know, eventually we weren't buying them used anymore, buying them new. Eventually the, you know, the companies would send over their technicians to help us set up, et cetera. But, you know, this was the virtue of time. We had time to do it, do it stepwise, um, you know, to, to start easy and, and then get hard. And um, today we, we would not have had that much time. Any other questions? Uh, yes, in the back. Why do, you, why do you say that uh, this year you actually have to work with the China? Yeah. The question was, why did I say that this year was themed China? Um, you know, I don't think that wasn't an official theme. I mean, there was a big, a big delegation from, from Guangdong. Um, 
This was just my observation. I've been going to CES for you know, 10, 10 or 12 years, and you know, sometimes it's the year of the 3D LT, uh, TV, but this year, I'm, I'm very sensitive to, to, to China. Um, again, I, I live there. Um, I'm a huge Sinophile. Um, we manufacture there. I, I sort of, I've been focused on China's emergence for 20 years now, and um, I'm really bullish about it. And so um, what I wanted to see was, um, so a couple of years ago, the Chinese companies were all in the other hall. And they were, you know, it was very, very kind of, you know, they're making components, very poor marketing, very poor displays, you know, very poor English, very poor marketing materials. And I think this was the year that the Chinese companies were front and center, right up there with the biggest, you know, U.S. companies and European companies with polished products, polished displays, polished marketing. It's very, it, um, what's, what's the most surprising is not that their products and the marketing and the brands were so good, but that they were willing to invest the money, that they cared enough about that kind of marketing branding moment to invest a lot of money in a CES display. There was, there was, it was a bit of a coming out party, I thought, this year. So that was my observation. I'm very sensitive to the, to the, to, to, you know, the weak signals getting strong. And this was the year where I felt that you know, it was a wake-up call, that everybody out there should have said, you know, we're going to be competing with these companies, and it starts now. Yes, sir, over here. So I have a friend that's interested in you know, creating desktops a few years ago in the community. Yeah. Yeah. The question was, um, you know, for a, he, he, a gentleman has a friend doing a desktop beer making machine, and how did, how would they how would he you know work today, um, especially if he can't work in the open? Um, well, you know, the, the the first thing is that you you kind of have to assume you don't have time to sell like you know to make one of them and then five of them and then ten of them, etc. Um, and they will get copied, by the way. It's very hard to protect IP, and you pretty much have to assume that's the, that's going to be the case. I mean, I would uh, my sense is that. Um, um, I'll bet that if you go to China, there are a hundred companies that make desktop beer making machines yeah. of one sort or another. And um, I'll bet all of those companies would love your friends' <laughs> insight into the market, connections in the US, um, and they would love to partner. My sense is that your friend shop probably should not be making a beer making machine. Your friend should be partnering with a company that's making beer making machines. And I'd, I'd get on a plane and, and, start, um, and start knocking on doors. I think that is the end. Uh, if there, uh, what, one more question in the end, and one, well, then I'll get off stage. Great question. I think that was loud enough that everybody could hear. Um, so right now, we are, we're an open source platform. We're kind of the Android of UAVs. And so we go with partnering. We're basically, hey, we're really good at software. Software's super hard. We give away our stuff for free, you know, we're like Android. Everybody out there can use it. We're, right now, we're focused on adoption. It's partnership in a kind of informal sense, which is they actually don't need our permission. There's no license. They just take our stuff, and they use it. And we're like, thank you very much. And you know, at a certain point, we'll get a little more formal. But, but right now, it's adoption. So it's a kind of an informal partnership. And, and they, they don't even know whether they're partnered. I mean, they may not know who we are. All they know is that there's a software out there that's really good, and they used it. Um, eventually, they'll, you know, we'll call them up. Um, so um, so, so uh, for, for on, a, on, a, on, a, on a software side, right now, they're adopting platforms. And they're choosing their platforms. And whether it's going to be you know, Linux this, or Android that, or in our case, you know, our, our, our drone software, they're picking their platforms. And you know, Bill Gates once famously said that, um, about piracy in China, he said, you know, look, if they're going to steal software, that we'd rather they steal our software. Because you know, someday, they'll be, uh, they'll be our customers. And you know, they'll be, you know, as, they say, as they say, the first taste is free. Um, so, you know, if they're going to use our, any IP, we'd rather they use our IP because, that, because they can drive a huge amount of adoption and they reach price points and form factors and markets that we can't touch. And, and you know, that's, that's, that's great. That's the way platforms work. Um, a, um, but if you're not in the software business and you don't have a platform, then the question is, what, how do you partner with them? The Chinese, in by and large, don't partner well. They haven't, ha haven't had to. There's a little, there's a trust issue. 
Um, they tend to part with people they know really, really well, and they don't know you really well. And in that case, I think there's a brief window of opportunity where these Chinese companies are, that, you know, so the company I described, the DJI, is good at everything. But there's a lot of companies that are not as sophisticated about things like marketing and branding and access to, you know, to uh, distribution channels um, in the West, et cetera. And so there's this brief window where they need us more than we need them. And you can go to the, the, the beer making, you know, company and sort of say, hey, you know, um, I, uh, I know people who would buy the desktop beer making machine. You know, here's some retailers, here's some distribution, here's, you know, here's a brand. I can help you with things you're not good at. And, and this, during this brief window, you can probably partner with them. That window may last five years. Um, and you partner with them doing what you do well. You understand the market. You understand the sort of the business side. You understand these kind of, you know, how to, how to actually get people to buy the thing. They understand the technology. And, and you can probably cement some deals. And those deals are probably more, 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 um, more kind of, you know, reliable than they were 10 years ago, where you never knew whether a contract was enforceable. You never really got to see the books. I mean, they're actually getting quite good at, at sort of standard business practices. So I think you've got five years to get on that plane, go to China, sign those deals, um, and then, uh, and then you'll be just competing with them. Then, then they won't need your skills anymore. All right. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, Chris. Great.